welcome him in. So he doesn't lose heart in that, that he doesn't. And you see where they've just been all over the place. And then they have the Judaizers that came in and told, were telling the Corinthians that Paul's not legitimate. He's not a real apostle and all of that. And you have to follow our rules if you guys want to really be serious believers. Our nice legalistic rules we have all laid out here for you. And so Paul has been sharing with them really his heart about what it really means to be walking with the Lord. And he uses himself as an example in the stuff that he's going through because the Corinthians were like many people in the church today. Well, all of, none of us really want to suffer. We don't really want to go through stuff. But the way that they approached, the way they dealt with life was they thought everything should be good for them and have no hiccups, no problems, everything comfortable, everything good. Just go forward with it, you know, have our be happy attitudes and just, you know, go on. And so Paul... is confronting them with that. He brings in this passage, describing to them how to have a consistent walk with the Lord. Because we know we all can be blown around at different times. seems like we have our ups, we have our downs. You know, the thing is, yeah, we're all going to have problems. And, you know, yeah, our lives will go like that a bit when the but what we don't want is for them to be going like, yeah, you know, all over the place, just being blown about by every wind of doctrine, every emotion, everything that's going on. How do we live then the consistent, a consistent Christian life, a consistent walk with the Lord? And Paul's going to share with them how to do that. And the first thing he shares in verses one through two is that they need to get serious about their relationship with the Lord. In fact, he says in verse one here, he says, we then as workers together with him, as he spoke about in chapter five, about being a worker, being a worker with God, Christ, talking about him and the other guys in his ministries, in his ministry. Then he got to uh, the Corinthians and he spoke about how in uh, verse 17 of chapter 5, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So you guys have been born again. And now that you're born again, he's made you ambassadors. He's made you, you know, he's put you in a place in whatever situation you are to be an ambassador for the kingdom of God. In fact, it says in verse 21 of chapter 5, well, actually verse 20, he says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So this, he's laying it out for him. God has a purpose. God has a plan for you. He loves you. He wants to work together with you. And that's the, per, that's the point here. That's the point that he's making. Guys, it's not all, in, in, all about arguing about this position or that place, this position. It's about your relationship with Jesus Christ and him working through your life and him using you for his purposes, for the kingdom of God. And he wants to, in that, have fellowship with you. So, he says to them, we then, as workers together with him, referring to God, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Whoa, what does that mean? Not to receive his grace in vain. Now, when you think about the word vain, it means empty or ineffective. 
that, you know, when something is vain, you try something in vain, it means you didn't accomplish what you wanted to accomplish in, in that thing, whatever you were doing. I once was going to run a marathon, but it was in vain because I had some physical problems in and leg problem or something and it didn't happen. So that attempt was in vain. But when he's talking here, when he's speaking of receiving the grace of God in vain, what he's speaking of there is not allowing it to have its intended effect in your life. Not allowing... Paul talk, spoke elsewhere about how he labored more than when he was, he was comparing himself. I think it was in 1 Corinthians talking about the other apostles and everything because they were comparing him to the other apostles. He said, I labored more, but not I, but the grace of God that was in me was doing the work. He allowed it. He partnered with God and that's what our will being involved, we partner with God for the accomplishing of his purposes. But we have to be submitted, surrendered to that in order for it to take place. And that's why he's saying to these hard-headed Corinthians, don't receive the grace of God or the, yeah, don't receive the grace of God in vain. And we have to accept to receive the same warning, not to receive the grace of God in vain. How often do we get in situations? You know, here's a good example. Anytime you seek to step out and do something new for the Lord or in your walk with the Lord, guess what happens? The enemy says, sure, go right ahead. No problem, dude. Have at No. You're going to face opposition. You, it might be external. It might be internal. I remember all the, every time, when, especially when we were in St. Augustine and had the church over there, and when there was a pastor's conference, uh, and we were going down there, we'd always, there would always be some, we would call it, you know, pre conference opposition. Because I remember one time we were going down, uh, the pastor from Orange Park, Chris Fredrich, good friend of mine, he's coming down, and right before they left, his daughter got sick. And he recognized it as, you know, you have to be sensitive. He recognized that it was spirit, it was opposition. And so, you know, he went ahead and went, her fever dropped. Right after that. You know, there's different things like that that happen. I know, you know, I'm not saying always leave your sick kids and do whatever you want. No, but I'm saying being sensitive, recognizing what's going, um, as Paul also said, we're not ignorant of the enemy's devices. So we look at that. We're conscious of that. But our tendency is always to shrink back to a comfortable position. If you haven't learned anything about, else about the Christian life, there's one thing to learn. God has not called you to be comfortable. He didn't say, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be comfortable. Not what he said. Jesus said in John 3, 8, the wind blows where it will. You hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it's coming from or where it's going. So is everyone who's born of the Spirit. Does that sound like comfortable to you? Nope. Sounds like he's going to lead you where he desires for you to go. And people aren't going to be able to figure you out all the time. You aren't even going to be able to figure it out all the time. So, not to receive the grace of God in vain. It means to not allow God to work the fruit of the Spirit in your life. 
It means not to uh, allow him to change your life. You're just set in your ways. You're just set in your ways and you don't want to change. You don't want to. And what's God working? Romans 8, 29, to conform you into the image of Christ. Are you there yet? Then he's going to keep working. He's going to continue to do that. And you're going to have to deal with yourself sometimes. We're going to have to deal with ourselves in that. So, we would all love to explain... You know, as we talk, as we share, as we worship, as we, uh, we all would desire to experience the presence of God in our lives. But the reason some believers don't experience the presence of God and the peace of God is because they're not stepping out of themselves and working together with God for his purposes. And that's what he's warning these guys of. They have their program, their idea of the way things should be. This is what they're doing. They're mad at Paul because he's offending them by stepping on their toes. He's saying, wait a second, guys. So as a worker together with God, Paul is pleading with them not to receive the grace of God in vain. They, this means that they would be boasting about their faith as they did in 1 Corinthians, as Paul was addressing. They were boasting about their faith without demonstrating the fruit of that faith in changed lives. Paul's warning them that their actions needed to match up with the words that they were claiming, the things that they were claiming. If there's no change in their lives, there's no reality to their faith. If someone is a believer who has truly and sincerely received Christ, there will be some change. Not saying instantly they're going to become a Billy Graham. But there will be change. There will be change. Now, in later in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, Paul will tell them again, and you see his heart for them, what he's longing for them, the desire that he has for them. In 2 Corinthians 13, 5, it says, examine yourselves as to whether you're in the faith. Imagine that. He's, all the work that he's done with all of these guys over the years, writing these letters, he, in fact, he lived there in Corinth for a year and a half teaching these guys, and now he's declaring to them, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you know yourselves that Christ or Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified or you don't pass the test? Realize this. Know this. He's saying to these flippant Christians, He's saying to these superficial people, he said, don't you know Christ is in you? Realize this. We're not just dealing with intellectualism. We're not just dealing with emotionalism. We're dealing with reality here. And that's that Jesus came, died for your sins on the cross, rose again, sent his Holy Spirit in you, and now he's living in you by the presence of his Holy Spirit This is serious business, people. This isn't just about you being happy. This isn't just about you being comfortable. This is about encountering God and living for his purposes.
One of the most difficult things about being a pastor is to realize that there's some in your church that have received the grace of God in vain, not allowing it to be effective, not allowing the Lord to change your life. You know, when you, my uh, son and his wife just a couple months ago had a daughter. Her name's Isla. She's the most beautiful baby in the world. And, and when you see a baby, they're first born, you know, no muscle control, none of that, you know. All, all over the place. But it's cool to see just after two and a half months how more focused, how more alert she is, how she's heading, holding her head up, how she's paying attention to things. It's great when a baby is a baby and acts like a baby. Paul will later say in this passage, I have to speak to you as children. You should have grown up by now. It's tragic when you see someone who's 20 or 30 acting like they were five. It's not cute anymore. And Paul is telling the Corinthians, guys, that's not cute. That's just not cute. Now in verse 2, he goes on to say, for he says, in an acceptable time, I have heard you, and in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. He's quoting from Isaiah 49, 8. And the context of Psalm 49, 8 is God through Isaiah prophesying to the nation of Israel, or excuse me, primarily to Judah, because the nation of Israel is about to be taken, the northern kingdom divided at this point, is about to be taken by Assyria into captivity. Judah in the south, the kingdom of Judah, is having a little bit of a good time under King Hezekiah mainly during most of, during a large part of Isaiah's ministry. And so you see there's all of this stuff going on here and they'll have to deal with the Assyrians and all of this stuff, God delivers them. But what he's saying to them is in dealing with the return of the Messiah, that's the context of Isaiah 49 8. That yes, you're going through all this stuff now. There's things you have to deal with now. Basically, step up. He's saying, ultimately, I will come. Ultimately, I will save. Ultimately, I will deliver. Have that relationship. Bring you into that kingdom age. So he said that in the first part, and when he said, in an acceptable time, I have heard you, and in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Then Paul takes it and applies it to the situation in here and says, behold, now is the time. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Since Jesus came the first time and dealt with sin, we're in living in the age of grace. Now is the time when everyone has an opportunity to get right with God. Everybody has that opportunity. You need to respond to God, he's saying here, when he speaks to you. Through his word, 
by his spirit through other people. You know, again, mainly most of when somebody says God speaks to me um, should mainly be through his, through his word. Applied to your life by the Holy Spirit. Paul is saying, when he speaks to you, you need to listen. You need to listen. If God is speaking to you about getting something right in your life, don't put it off. It's a dangerous thing to think that you can put off God. In fact, in Proverbs 29, 1, Solomon wrote, He who is often rebuked and hardens his neck will suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Dangerous position to be in. The God have to tell you something over and over again. He, said in, he says in uh, Genesis 6, My spirit won't always strive with man. He's not always going to do that. He gives you the opportunity. He gives you the opportunity. In fact, as well in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 through 15, Paul, or the writer to the Hebrews, which may have been Paul, warns them, warns the Jewish believers the danger of drifting. Remember, they came from the ones he was writing to, obviously were saved out of a Jewish background, and their tendency was to drift back to Judaism. Our tendency as Gentiles is to drift. You know how you drift? You know all that's required for you to drift? To do nothing. That's it. That's all they're required. Just don't do anything. If you're on a stream, you never notice that you're going on the stream, just stop rowing. What happens? There you go. And the same is true with our relationship with the Lord. So if you're not constantly in a sense, maintaining your relationship with the Lord. Don't be surprised when your relationship with God is cold and dry. Israel, as the writer of the Hebrews said as well, God delivered them out of Egypt, but they failed to enter into his rest. Why? Because of unbelief. Simply because of unbelief. And see, this is what he's confronting the Corinthians with. You're getting your eyes on all of these other things. You're not focused in on what the Lord is doing and how he's working in and through your life and what he desires to do with your life. You're sitting around contemplating your navel and taking your temperature. And now we see in verses 3 through 10 that he's telling them to align themselves with things from God's perspective, to focus on, on God, to get God's perspective on these matters and not simply focus on the negative or not just to focus on your own things. He begins in verse 3 by saying, we give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be Blamed. Paul is careful not to give people a reason to be offended. We're not to unnecessarily be offending people. You know, some people get pleasure out of offending people. They just want to do something for shock value and offend, get a reaction. Paul's saying not to do that. In fact, in Romans 12, 18, he says, if it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Much as it's up to you. It's not always up to you. But as much as it's up to you, some people get mad at you no matter what you do. But as much as it's up to you, live at peace with all men. He also said in 1 Corinthians 10, 32, 
give no offense either to the Jews or the Greeks or to the church of God. Not to be a reason for stumbling. Not to, when it talks about offense in that context, it's talking about, I believe the word there is scandalon, scandalized. It means something you trip over. Don't give anyone else a reason to trip over you so that they don't come into a right relationship with the Lord, so that they don't come into a closer relationship with the Lord. Don't get in the way, is what he's saying there. Don't be a cause for offense. In fact, he says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 22, abstain from every form of evil, every outward appearance evil. If something even looks evil, don't do it. If it looks evil, you know, Paul said as well in 1 Corinthians, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. They don't, everything I do doesn't build somebody else up. It's not that you constantly have to be doing that, but you don't want to be doing the opposite. You don't want to be tearing people, people down or putting a stumbling block in their way of either coming to know the Lord or growing in the relationship with him. You don't want anyone to be offended by anything other than the gospel so that they have no excuse. As he says in 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 25, the cross, they were offended, the Jews were offended by the cross And the Gentiles were both offended by the cross because, you know, one was looking for wisdom. The other one, it was an offense. It was a stumbling block. Now, people will often be offended when you don't give in to their desires and what they want but that's not your responsibility. Giving in does not help them. You need to simply give them the truth. Again, as Paul did, speaking the truth in love. Now, in verses 4 through 5, he commends their ministry through the problems that he has. And on down through verse 10, he goes through all this series of things that we'll get into a little bit. But the point is, he's commending or what it means to commend is to put things together, to put facts together, to make things clear and obvious. But let me back up here and, and read these two verses as it says, but in all things, we commend ourselves as ministers of God in much patience in tribulations, in needs, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fastings. As I said, to commend is to stand with or put things together. Paul's saying that he seeks to give no offense so that people are able to put the facts together and see the v validity of their ministry, yes, but in the context of seeing the reality of the gospel. It's not all about his ministry. So he's not just speaking of his ministry, but it's ministry to an end. If they're seeing, as they're putting together and they see the facts of the ministry, they see the motivation behind it, they see the Lord working. In fact, Paul, as he's commending himself here in this sense, he's not talking about degrees that he has. He's not talking about people that he knows. But he expects people to be able to see the legitimacy of the ministry, see that it's through the work of the Holy Spirit. There should be a definite sense that the Holy Spirit is working through our lives and our ministry. And in fact, in uh, 
I love it in John 21. It's one of my favorite accounts. Is when Jesus had told the disciples to go up to Galilee, that he would meet them there. They're up there waiting. Peter looks at the other guys and says, I'm going fishing. Typical guy response. I'm going fishing. Other guy said, all right, we'll go with you. The idea behind that is I'm going back to fishing. It was like a perpetual thing that he was talking about here. So they're out on and says, they fished all night and caught nothing. It should have started to sound familiar to them. Because this happened to them when they were called, when Peter especially was called in the first place. But, you know, he was oblivious. Then this guy shows up on the beach. It's probably hazy out still early morning, so they can't really see, see who it is. And the person on the beach yells out, little children, have you caught anything? And they say, no. He said, throw your net on the other side of the boat. Now, guys, think about this. Does it really make a difference throwing the net over here or over here? In a natural sense, no. But in obedience, they did that, pulled it up, and it said there were so many fish in it, it gives the number 153, that they had trouble pulling it in. Then what happens? John looks to Peter. It's the Lord. Now, so, and that's when Peter jumps in the water and swims to shore and, you know, the rest of the story. But the point being there is they were trying to do all of this in their flesh, on their own. So often we can try to do ministry or anything else that we do in the flesh, whether it be, I mean, whether it be any part of our lives, or being a wife or a husband, uh, being a parent, schooling, any of those things, we can do that in our flesh. And we can fish all night and catch nothing. But if we do what we do, submitted in an obedience to the Lord, not only is it blessed with fruit, but then it then becomes a witness to other people to look and say, that was obvious the Lord. Well, sure wasn't you. And that's where we want to be. We don't want the attention to go to ourselves, ourself, but people like Paul, and this is part of the reason he goes through all this stuff that he's suffering. He's saying to the Corinthians, you are worried about status, position, looking good, all of these things. And he's emphasizing the point that, hey, I go through all these problems. I don't know what's up with you guys. I go through all these problems, but what becomes obvious is God working through them. That is the Lord. That's what we want people to see. They don't want, we don't want people to see how smart we are, how we have all our ducks in a row, how, boy, you know, that's part of the blessing of having a small church. If anything gets done, it's the Lord. It's not because we have a great organization. It's not because we have an incredible amount of resources. It's the Lord. I love it when visitors come in here, look at our bulletin, talk to people and say, for a little church, you guys got an awful lot going on here. Yeah, it's the Lord. That's what it is. It's not us. Working together with God, being sensitive to the directing of the Holy Spirit and walking it out. So, that is the sense that people should get from us even when we're experiencing difficulties, that God's working for his purposes. Because people will see that in your life as well. Here Paul describes really three kinds of sufferings, general struggles and trials, suffering, uh, suffering of affliction from other people, 
and then self-inflicted suffering. There are things in the Christian life and ministry that can only be learned through suffering. I know that's not the message you wanted to hear. You wanted to hear a good prosperity message this morning of name it and claim it, blab it and grab it and go out and be good. That's not Christianity. The scripture even says in Hebrews 5, 8, that Jesus, though he was a son, he learned obedience. And that's the primary lesson. He learned obedience through the things that he suffered. Not that he was ever disobedient, but as he grew as a man, he learned obedience. He learned what it meant to be obedient to the Lord through the things that he suffered, and that is the same thing for us. When we experience difficulties, it, it brings things to a head of what our choice is. Am I going to address or face this situation in the Lord, or am I going to try to work it out the way the world tells you do, to do? Or are you just going to do what I feel like doing? That's our options. But we are doing what he calls us to obedience. In fact, in the end of 1 John, it says we know that we, he uh, hears our prayers and will answer our prayers because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. You see, that dynamic of God working in our lives through the things that we experience, always the goal is to be closer to him, to be more effective in him and for him. That's the desire. That's the goal. That's what he's working out. That's what Paul's challenging the Corinthians to face here. But in this, um, the writer of the Hebrews also said, well, backing up a little bit, in the beginning of, in verse four, where it talked about um, that he faces all of these things in patience, in patience, not impatience, but in patience. We always face things in patience. But in patience, as the writer to the Hebrews said in chapter 10, verse 36, for you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. You see, what patience is when we exercise patience, it's active endurance. It's when you have that choice, when you're facing that situation of that trial, whatever your experience, when you decide you're going to respond the way God desires you to respond to that situation, it takes active endurance. It takes, you're facing the situation, you know it's not comfortable, but you know what God's point in the situation is. So you go forward in that. Go, he goes on in verses 6 through 7 by purity, and we get part of the way we can endure here. And he says, by purity, by knowledge, by long sufferings, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. Now, the list that Paul gives here in these verses is the means by which we exercise this active endurance. 
when confronted by trials, everyone doesn't come out the same. It all depends on how you respond to those trials. The outcome is dependent upon those, your response. Paul made sure that he was responding to the trials with these weapons. As he said here, he responds in purity. He's making sure, again, I have to be careful how the, the prefix on these words. In purity, not impurity, in purity, that he responds to the situation when he's confronted, when he's confronted by other people or whatever the situation, that he responds in a pure, godly manner. Then, by knowledge, knowledge of what the Word of God says, knowing how the way things really are. With long suffering, understanding the process there, by kindness, always, no matter how you're treated, respond in kindness. By the Holy Spirit, again, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the working of the Holy Spirit is how we do that, how we accomplish. In sincere love. We discovered in chapter 5, remember that Paul said, for the love of Christ compels us. Application here of that, what he meant. When you're in those situations, when you're in difficulty, when you're being afflicted possibly from other people, you should be compelled by the love of God. By the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness. Ephesians 6, putting on the whole armor of God. And then finally in that verse it says, on the right hand and on the left. Now, on the right hand and on the left, it's a military expression there. On the one hand, it's, it's determining how you're supposed to respond to a situation. Are you to respond offensively or defensively to the situation? And you see that with Paul writing to the Corinthians. On one hand, he's being Bam, straightforward with them. Guys, this is a problem. You need to repent. Other times, he's acting defensively like when he's describing his ministry, not to justify his ministry, but to say, hey, look at the facts. This is the way it is. There's at times when we need to be direct and on the offense when we're facing things. Um, I think one of those issues is always the abortion issue. We need to be on the offensive in that because we are called to preserve life. That's a part of our calling. To deliver those who are being led to destruction, the scripture says. That's a calling. The early Christians, well, yes, in Rome they did have abortions. But there was a way that they did it. But another thing they did, if they had an unwanted child, they would take it out, walk outside the, the hills of Rome, go out the country a little bit, and just leave the baby on the hillside for the wolves. The Christians made it their job to go around to be searching for those kids to deliver them from death. That's what we're called to do. You see, this is what people don't understand about the whole abortion issue. Is that God has actually Allow, allows people to share in the creative process, the creation of people. It's participating with God in his creative activity. Abortion is to throw that back in his face and say, I don't want it. 
I know better. It's to reject God's plan for man's plan. Now, so as I said, we know we're to know when we're to be offensive, the issue we're supposed to be direct and upfront about, and the things we're supposed to step back and de be defensive on. Not always defending ourselves in the sense of, you know, but just knowing when we're to, to step back and let the Lord work the situation out. Then in verses 8 through 10, we read, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown, yet well known, as dying and behold we live, chastened and yet not destroyed, not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, having nothing but possessing all things. Now, Paul wraps up this list by giving us a series of pairs. And one thing in the pair, it starts out with the positive godly perspective being in the front on the first couple of them. And then it switches where the godly or the, the godly perspective they have goes to the second or God's perspective and it goes to the second thing. But it's, that's what the pair is. It's one thing the way the world sees your situation versus the way God sees the situation and why God's dealing with it. As it said, by honor and dishonor, when I'm honored or when I'm dishonored, when the, whether you know, somebody gives me an evil report or a good report, as deceivers, being accused of being a deceiver, yet being true. And here's where he gets into it. As unknown, people don't care who you are, but I'm known to God. That's the perspective. And not worrying about being known to people. The objective in ministry we do isn't for our church to get a name. Who cares? To know our vote, and I've struggled with this over the years. But coming to the realization that the only one that matters who knows you is God. The only one who matters. He's the one we ultimately stand before. We all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. As dying. Yet behold, we live. Chastened but not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich. I love this last one. Having nothing, yet possessing all things. What in the world is that? Having nothing and possessing all things. That's where you are as a Christian. You might have nothing. And again, we can't go from the outward perspective because the things that we see are temporary, as we discovered before in chapter four. But the things which are e the things that are not seen are eternal. Realizing our Father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Not only that, He owns the hills. He owns. The country those hills are in, he owns the planet that country's in, he owns the solar system that that planet is in, he owns the galaxy that that solar system is in, he owns that universe that you, know, you get the drift. He owns it all. And I'm his child. I possess all things. The cool thing about that is when you realize that, and as Paul has... You can't be controlled. When you're looking 
And as Paul repeatedly says, and as we saw earlier in Corinthians, he said our sufficiency is of God. He's made us able ministers of the new covenant. I'm sufficient for whatever God calls me to do. I don't have to... You know, there's too much politicizing in the church in the sense that trying to get people to come on board with us and agree with us so we can accomplish something. No, we just simply need to work, walk in obedience to what God calls us to do. Our sufficiency is of him. It's not a matter of how many people you can get on your side. When David went to face Goliath, you imagine him going up, God, I get, I get away. I got to get some of these guys to agree with me over here, some of these other Israelites, so they can, you know, they're the, all the guys that were saying, can't be done. What did David say when he stood before Goliath, though? He said, you come to me with a sword and a spear, I come to you in the name of the Lord God of Israel whose armies you have defiled, defied. So he came to them in the name of the Lord and that's all we have to do. You see different situations as well, more current. Remember David Wilkerson from the cross and the switchblade. He felt God calling him he saw these guys get arrested, gang members get arrested in New York. He felt like God was calling him to go up there. So he went up there. And that situation didn't work out, but God used that situation and him getting in the newspaper because he was hauled out of court for raising the Bible and said, Judge, I want to talk to you, you know, and he gets hauled out of court. And Teen Challenge started from that. What was the ultimate result of that? Because he sought to be obedient. He sought to walk it all out. But possessing all things, we have it all in the Lord. We evaluate our lives from the basis of who we are in Christ not by what the world in its rebellion against God thinks of us. You see, the temptation is to choose comfort like the Corinthians were doing rather than come into conflict with the world, the flesh, and the devil. But if you'll choose the purpose of God, you get to experience him working together with us through our lives. Now, in the last three verses, we see now Paul's just challenged to them as he's been open with them for them to be open with him, as he says in verse 11, O oh, Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. Paul has spent years speaking the truth and love to them, laying things out for them. He loved them, and his heart was wide open to them. He wasn't holding them at a distance and limiting his love towards them. They thought that he was, but it was because as we'll see in the next verse, their own actions, their own attitudes. And Paul is saying here, you know, guys, you need to be open. You need to be honest with one another, but with God and with yourself. Then in verse 12, we read, you are not restricted by us, not being, he's saying you're not being limited in your growth in your relationship with the Lord because of us. But you are restricted by your own affections. You're restricted by what, these desires, these things you have going on in your heart 
those things that you're holding in such a priority that you love that you're not willing to let go of. The Corinthians were trying to play the victim with Paul. You don't love us. His straightforwardness had offended them. They felt they couldn't get past this conflict with them, with him. So they would say that Paul didn't love them, but the truth is that their problem was that they loved themselves and the world too much. They were kind of like those modern day teachers who take Matthew 5.43 out of context. You know, well, before that, in the verse before that is, says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, in verse 43, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, what have people today latched on to? It says you've got to love your neighbor as yourself. That means before I can love my neighbor, I have to love myself. What? Boy, you have to strangle that verse to do that. You're going to wrestle it around, make it to say what you want to say. Because it doesn't say that. The assumption is that you already love yourself. So it's basically Jesus was saying, get over yourself and love your neighbor. But there are people out there today in the church saying you have to focus on loving yourself first. And, and again, it gets into all of that manipulation and control because, you know, they'll come up with a program for you to do that. So they had a selfish and worldly attitude toward Paul and were having difficulty receiving. It hurts when you pour yourself out to others in the Lord and they're not able to receive it and to grow because of it. You pour yourself out and it's the way that people receive. Again, it's like the parable of the sower or the soils. You throw out you throw out the word, you throw out the word, but it depends on the condition of the soil. And that's one of the things that's the most difficult about ministry because as much as you do, as much as maybe stand up here and talk, you have no control over the soil. You have no control over what goes on after you put it out. Have to leave it to the Lord. Have to trust the Lord to be working. And what's hard about it, one thing that's incredibly hard about that is you know when you see the way people respond because of experience you've had over time you realize what people are going to go through because of the choices that they make. And it hurts. Now, in verse 13, he wraps up here and says, Now in return for the same, I speak as to children. You also be open. He's saying, I've poured my heart out to you. I love you. I've been perfectly open and honest with you, telling you about what my motivations are, what's going on with me, what's God doing, the suffering I'm experiencing. I'm speaking like the children because well, it's like it says in Hebrews chapter 5, the end of chapter 5. It says, and solid food is for the mature who by reason of use or exercise have their senses exercised to discern good and evil by reason of use. So Paul is speaking to them 
Well, the writer of the Hebrews was speaking there, is telling them not no longer to be children, but to take and apply the word. Because solid food is for the mature, who by reason of use is taking the word and applying it, rightly dividing the word of truth, taking it and applying to their lives. He's telling them, the Corinthians, to be open. Don't think that you figured it all out. But to be open, to be challenged to grow in your relationship with the Lord. None of us have arrived. We should all be willing to receive from someone else. And ask the question when someone confronts us, you know, go to the Lord with it and say, Lord, was this you? To be open. That's all Paul's asking the Corinthians to be. Just open your heart. Just to open your heart to the Lord. So do you desire to have a consistent relationship with the Lord? Get serious there and realize that what you're facing, you face in the Lord. Never see yourself as in anything you're going through as apart from the Lord. Oh, I got into this. God didn't know what was going on. He's right there. I love the picture of children of Israel, Shadmach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar looks in there and says, didn't I throw three guys in there? There's a fourth one in there. And his appearance is like the son of God. Jesus was in was with them in the fiery furnace and he is with you in whatever situation you go through. Align yourself, your life, with view it at, with God's perspective. Be open and honest with yourself, with the Lord, and with others. God desires to work together with each and every one of us for his purposes. And he will do it. Just be open. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word, your grace, your love, Lord. Oh, we're floored by it. Lord, just give us open hearts. Help our hearts to be open to you, Lord, that we might receive from you that we might receive your word and grow by it, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand as we...